This is 19th century Vietnam, a feudal state with a butt ton of valuable natural resources. Hey Vietnam, do you mind if we colonize you and steal all your resources? The Vietnamese did mind, but the French colonized them anyways. France went to the powerful landowners and was like, how about you keep your power and privileges, but you help us keep everyone under control. This was a sweet deal for the French, who got rich of Vietnamese resources, but the Vietnamese people benefited very little. Only 25% of them could read, and 90% lived in poverty working for large landowners, French farms or factories. A young Vietnamese called Wen Sing Gong thought that this was deeply uncool, and in 1911 left for France to get an education. There he came across the works of Marx and Lenin, who described that <sighs> In a capitalist system, the landowners and wealthy individuals would team up to systematically oppress the workers and poor farmers, and that powerful capitalist nations relied on the exploitation of their resources from underdeveloped nations to sustain their way of life, and that thus the only way to end imperialism and the colonialism that came with it was to end capitalism itself. This made a lot of sense to young Wen, who became a big fan. In 1919, after the end of World War I, he contacted American President Woodrow Wilson's team in Versailles and gave them a petition asking for help in turning Vietnam independent. The request was ignored. At the same time, independence movements were growing in Vietnam. Although they were led by the Communist Party, they had wide support from people who wished to see a free Vietnam. In 1930, workers at a Michelin plant in Phu Xian went on strike to protest their terrible working conditions. The French brutally crushed the strike and executed the leaders by guillotine. The movement was interrupted when Messerschmann decided to invade Poland and then France, which severely limited France's ability to manage its colonial empire. Yoink, said Japan, immediately taking over Vietnam and its resources. Although they too were brutal in their occupation, the Japanese victory over the French sent a clear message. The Europeans were not invincible. Wen returned to Vietnam and took on the name Ho Chi Minh. He then founded the League for an Independent Vietnam, or Viet Minh for short, and soon began guerrilla warfare against the Japanese occupiers. Who is this? I'm the OSS. The what? Ah, the predecessor to the CIA? Oh, you should have just said that. Listen, I heard you're fighting the Japanese. We are fighting the Japanese too. Wouldn't it be like super cool if we fought them together? Mm, how do I know I can trust you? I'll give you tons of weapons. You son of a bee. I'm in. The OSS supplied the Viet Minh with weapons, munitions, food and medical supplies and promised that the US would later support an independent Vietnam. The fighting was devastating for the Vietnamese. And in late 1945, Japanese appropriation of rice farms, accompanied by floods and poor weather conditions, led to a terrible famine that caused the death of between 1 and 2 million Vietnamese. The Viet Minh did their best to help, often stealing food from the occupiers and distributing it among the starving villagers, saving countless people and gaining incredible amounts of support. After Japan surrendered, Vietnam was finally free. So on September 2nd, Ho declared the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. He was reportedly a huge fan of the US, even having a picture of George Washington and a copy of the US Declaration of Independence on his desk. He even sought the advice of an OSS officer in framing the Declaration of Independence. The Vietnamese Declaration begins with, all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Sounds familiar? Wow, that is so moving! You totally made me reconsider my stance on colonialism. Really? No. The moment Allied forces left the country, the French army began retaking Vietnam. They recognized the DRV above the 17th parallel, but demanded it became part of the French Union. Okay, let's agree that Cochin China will get to vote on whether to unite with me or join the French Union. Deal? Deal. Uh, what are you doing? Oh, coach in China is joining the French Union. But we just agreed I to- I have no idea what you're talking about. Negotiations broke down. The Viet Minh wanted nothing short of Vietnamese independence, while the French were unwilling to lose control of their former colony. By December 1946, violent skirmishes broke out across the border and the French attempted to reoccupy the North by force. But the North resisted. They had bled and died for independence against the Japanese and were not going to give it up without a fight. Alright boys, the Vietnamese are resisting our occupation, so we need a new approach. 
Nuke em. How about we rebrand? The Viet Minh are communists, right? So we are not colonizing them, we are liberating them from communism and maybe in the process taking all the resources. Can't we just let them be free? I mean, we have already extracted enough resources from them. Don't they have a right to serve the... You. Let's go with your idea. The French returned the former Emperor Bao Dai to Vietnam from Hong Kong and recognized him as the leader of the Republic of Vietnam. Bao Dai received support from the upper classes of Vietnam and the war turned into a civil war. In 1949, Mao Zedong came to power in China. Whatever Vietnam needs and China has, we will provide. He recognized the DRV as an independent country and began sending tons of weapons and munitions to Vietnam and even helped train their fighters. China had its own reasons to help Vietnam. After all, they were seeing an anti-communist crusade just a few miles from its own border and they were getting a little nervous. For them, defending Vietnam was not just about defending a fellow communist country, it was a matter of national security. What's that? Harry Truman is now president of the United States and he is really scared that communism will take over the world. So he gave Western Europe a bunch of money so that they would depend on them and not the USSR. He then founded NATO and in 1950 joined the war in Korea. Well, if you want me to join your Russia club, you'll have to help me against the Vietnamese. Deal. Truman didn't need much convincing and by the early 1950s, the US was paying for 80% of the French expenses. American support got to the point that the French Air Force was mostly comprised of American planes. The war in Indochina became France's number one dollar earning export. But it didn't have to be like this. In 1945 and 46, Ho Chi Minh had written at least eight letters to President Truman asking for his help in bringing the matter of Vietnamese independence to the United Nations. Despite the fact that Ho Chi Minh and his followers had worked closely with the Americans against Japan, and despite the fact that Ho was much closer to the US than to the USSR, the Americans didn't answer any of the letters, and instead sided with the French. Ho was, after all, a communist, and Ho Ho Ho, he had to go. When the war began, the French controlled most of the large cities in South Vietnam, where the rich elites granted them full support but the Viet Minh controlled the countryside. The war was brutal and bloody, and neither side was making real progress. Hey, how about we talk this out? Okay, but let me ask my mom first. Mom, can I go to peace negotiations with North Vietnam? Well, I don't know, did you kill all the commies yet? No, but you can go to peace negotiations after you kill all the commies, okay? The US threatened to withdraw all economic and military aid if France even negotiated with the Viet Minh, so the French delegation never arrived. Despite American aid, the guerrilla warfare was incredibly costly for the French and their grip on Vietnam loosened year after year. Bao Dai was an absent leader and little more than a French puppet. There was low morale and chronic desertions within South Vietnam's army and even in France, the conflict was becoming very unpopular. To turn things around, the French came up with a plan to force the Viet Minh into an open battle where they believed the superior military would prevail. In 1953, they airlifted troops to a valley called Diem Bien Phu to cut the communist supply lines. The fighting was so fierce and the losses so terrible that even the Viet Minh began to lose morale. Even if they defeated the French at Diem Bien Phu, the Viet Minh knew they couldn't kick the superior French military out of Vietnam, and the French were aware that they could never take control of the countryside. Finally, both sides decided to meet in Geneva to negotiate but they both wanted to be in as good a position as possible on the ground before negotiations started. The Viet Minh gathered their anti-air artillery in the hills around the valley and sieged the base for months. Their camouflaged cannons were incredibly hard for the French to spot and they harassed the French air supply with virtual impunity. With their forces at Dien Bien Phu cut off from the rest of their army, the French realized that they had put their head into a noose. On March 13, 1954, the Viet Minh began a direct assault. They used their cannons to weaken the French defenses and dug tunnels to get as close as possible before storming the base. The Viet Minh took terrible casualties, but slowly they took over the base. The French desperately pleaded to the US for aid, hoping for a direct intervention. President Eisenhower, another firm believer in the domino theory, considered several possibilities to help them. Nukem! Stop suggesting that! 
Eisenhower considered joining the war, but a military assessment determined that the US would have to commit at least half a million military personnel just to stabilize the situation. Knowing that the American public wouldn't support another war in Asia so soon after Korea, he decided against it. After months of fighting, the French surrendered at Dien Bien Phu on May 7th. The next day, negotiations began in Geneva. Vietnam would be divided at the 17th parallel with a demilitarized zone on both sides. Ho Chi Minh would keep control of the north and Bao Dai of the south. Vietnamese people would have freedom of movement between north and south for 300 days to choose where they wanted to be. Neither North nor South Vietnam could receive outside military help, an international commission comprised of Canada, Poland and India would supervise elections in 1956 to choose if the Vietnamese people wanted to unify under Ho Chi Minh or Bao Dai. All things considered, the deal was quite good for the French, as it allowed many of its economic interests, such as the Michelin rubber plantation, to continue operating. But the Viet Minh were disappointed, they wanted a united Vietnam, nothing less and they had momentum after the victory at Dien Bien Phu. Many of their leaders wished to keep fighting to reach a better deal. Okay, all in favor? I agree. <sighs> I agree. I agree. <clears throat> we don't agree. Neither the US nor South Vietnam signed the Geneva Accords. The United States even refused to recognize the independence of North Vietnam. While the negotiations were still taking place, the US set up a special paramilitary unit inside Vietnam led by CIA operative Edward Lansdale. And their first mission, weaken the North by making as many people as possible migrate South through psychological warfare. The CIA created propaganda slogans and leaflets appealing to the devout Catholic with themes such as Christ has gone to the South and the Virgin Mary has departed from the North. But they didn't stop there. Gather round, everyone! Look what I just found! I hold in my hand an official Viet Minh document detailing the horrors they want to do to all of you! Um, but why is it in English? We all speak Vietnamese! What do you mean in English? I specifically told them to- Damn it, Thomas, you had one job! In the days following this massive campaign, refugee registration to the south tripled. The CIA also infiltrated paramilitary forces in the north, contaminated the oil supply of the bus company of Hanoi to wreck the bus engines, sabotage the railroad, and much more. Just four days before the reunification election, Prime Minister Wo Din Diem of South Vietnam issued a statement making it clear that he had no intention of carrying them out. Come on, man, we had an agreement! No. Diem, just like Eisenhower, knew that Ho Chi Minh would easily win any national election. Eisenhower wrote in his memoirs, I have never talked or corresponded with a person knowledgeable in Indo-Chinese affairs who did not agree that had elections been held as of the time of the fighting, possibly 80% of the population would have voted for the communist Ho Chi Minh as their leader. So the Eisenhower administration ensured that Diem postponed the elections as long as possible. This was only possible due to the threat of US intervention. Without it, the South could have never refused the elections without being immediately overrun by the Viet Minh armies. The US justified their support for Diem by claiming that elections wouldn't be free, but that didn't really make any sense. Ho was so popular that he didn't need to resort to fraud to win elections, and besides, the United Nations and an international control commission set up by the Geneva Accords had already agreed to supervise the elections. In the end, the elections for unification never took place and Vietnam remained divided. In the north, the communists implemented land reform and collectivization. They also repressed class enemies, killing several thousand people. Ho Chi Minh later admitted that they had gone too far and gave some of the land back. Still, the reforms were a success. Food production increased by 60% and the economy surpassed its peak under French rule. It also made the party incredibly popular. At the same time, the South was in political turmoil, filled with powerful warlords and religious factions clashing for power. President Eisenhower chose Diem as the man to build South Vietnam around. In 1955, Diem challenged Bao Dai for leadership and heavily rigged the votes. Just go for like 60%, we don't wanna be too obvious. Uh huh. You promise to be discreet? Mm hmm yes, absolutely very discreet. No one will suspect a thing. 
And the winner of the election is Woden DM with wow 98.2% of the votes. Thank you, what a surprise. I want to thank everyone who totally voted for me and those who didn't watch it. <laughs> no, seriously, I'm coming for you, f homies, p and you. DM immediately imprisoned 20,000 political opponents, many of whom he inaccurately accused of being communists. And in complete violation of the Geneva Accords, the US sent 350 military men to Saigon to begin building up its military. By 1959, the country was still divided, and Ho Chi Minh and his party really didn't like that. To them, it appeared that the only thing the war had achieved was to replace their French colonizers for American ones. Okay guys, we need to do something about those pesky Americans. We've had enough wars, let us focus on the North first. Let's become prosperous and successful. That will inspire our comrades in the South to join us. <laughs> yeah, right. The Americans will never allow it. We all know that they have one goal, to destroy us and everything we believe in. Well, what do you propose then? We go for the South first. We will show them our peaceful ideas and way of life. By force. The Viet Minh went with this guy's idea and formed the National Liberation Front, a formal political face for the insurgency they were sponsoring in the South. Their military arm became known as the Liberation Army of South Vietnam. President Diem dubbed them Vietnamese Communists or Viet Cong. The Viet Cong began assassinating Saigon government officials and ambushing government troops. They had so much control over the countryside that they often functioned as a shadow government. To supply their fighters in the south, the north built a massive network of supply routes that went from North Vietnam through Laos and Cambodia and into South Vietnam. This was the beginning of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Diem was quickly losing control over South Vietnam. The new US President John F. Kennedy increased military aid from 700 to 16,000 military personnel by the time he was assassinated. He also gave them millions of dollars and logistical and air force aid that allowed the South Vietnam army to expand to 200,000 strong. On January 2nd, 1963, the South attacked a Viet Cong position around the village of Ap Bac and got pummeled. Three Americans died in the fighting. In the meantime, Diem was becoming increasingly unpopular. He was a devout Catholic and continuously favored pro-Catholic policies going so far as banning the public display of the flag of other religions. And if this was not bad enough, the law came into effect right on a Buddhist holiday. This led to massive demonstrations which were brutally suppressed, which led to even more protests, during which a Buddhist monk immolated himself. Diem's sister-in-law, who had the role of first lady, openly mocked the dead monk. Let them burn and we shall clap our hands. If the Buddhists wish to have another barbecue, I will be glad to supply the gasoline and a match. This was too much for the US ambassador in Vietnam, who determined that Diem had become a liability. The US then supported a coup that ended up killing Diem. Kennedy was assassinated a few weeks later and Lyndon B. Johnson became president. The Viet Cong exploited the power vacuum and increased aggression in South Vietnam. They even sank an American ship moored on the Saigon River. During a storm on August 4th, US ships at the Gulf of Tonkin claimed to be under attack by the North Vietnamese while in international waters. As a response, Congress authorized the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which allowed President Johnson to increase military presence in Vietnam. We now know that there was no real attack on US ships, but whether it was an honest mistake due to a system malfunction or if it was a deliberate lie to escalate involvement in Vietnam remains unknown. It is now 1965 and the Pentagon estimated that there are between 20 and 100,000 Viet Cong and North Vietnam soldiers present in the South. LBJ wanted to avoid an escalation with China and the Soviet Union, so he decided to start off with small attacks and increase the strength as needed. To intimidate the North into surrendering, LBJ authorized a series of bombing raids just north of the 17th parallel. Then, in Operation Rolling Thunder, American planes bombed key military infrastructure. Hey, I know that you guys are kind of getting wrecked by our airstrikes, so I'll offer you a deal. I'll call off Rolling Thunder and initiate a massive aid deal for the North if you agree to stop supporting the Viet Cong and recognize the South as an independent, non-communist state. Okay. Wait, really? No. Rolling Thunder failed to achieve its goal.
In June 1965, the Viet Cong overwhelmed several regiments of the Southern Army, including three US-trained Ranger battalions, and captured the provincial capital at Dong Chuai, just 60 miles from Saigon. To add to the chaos, there was another coup in Saigon. With South Vietnam in such a fragile state, President Johnson now had to choose between losing Vietnam and sending American troops. You may be able to guess what he chose to do. The American army took control of the battles and relegated the Arvin to improving relations in the countryside. But the South Vietnamese were not pleased with being shunted aside while Americans took over the war. Besides, they were prone to corruption and violence, which often undermined the purpose of the operation. The country didn't have the infrastructure to support such a large military operation, so the US had to build it themselves. With thousands of American troops arriving in Vietnam, Rolling Thunder now focused on bombing the Ho Chi Minh Trail to cut off the Viet Cong supply lines. But the North, with a lot of help from China and the Soviet Union, was getting very good at defending their skies, and their anti-aircraft system was becoming formidable. On April 3, 1965, the Northern Air Force intercepted the US bombing of the Tanwa Bridge in one of the war's first air-to-air -air engagements. Although they lost all their planes, the Vietnamese did manage to take down two supersonic American warplanes in a dogfight. The message was clear. The North was not going to let the Americans control the skies without a fight. During Operation Starlight, the US launched a surprise attack on a Viet Cong position at the village of Van Tong. The Vietnamese fought ferociously, and although they were defeated and lost 600 fighters, the US also took hundreds of casualties. Americans got another costly victory at Ia Trang, where three North Army divisions tried to cut South Vietnam in half. The Americans were beginning to grasp the magnitude of the casualties they would face.